Good afternoon. We'd like to thank all of you for attending this particular lecture. We know that there is a lot of wonderful lectures going on, even at this moment, in various rooms around this auditorium. So thank you for choosing to come and hear Dr. Jimmy Gutman. Dr. Gutman is an emergency, a board-certified emergency physician from McGill University, and he received his training at the University of Calgary in Alberta and took up his residency in emergency medicine at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was chief resident. And upon his return to Canada, he went on to an accomplished career, eventually becoming the undergraduate director and residency training director of emergency medicine at McGill University in Montreal. Dr. Gutman, for the last 20 years, has veered away from emergency medicine. He has gone into family practice, and he is now the leading author in the field of glutathione. And so, Dr. Jimmy Gutman, we're honored to have you with us today. Thank you, Candice. Um, does anybody here remember the game you used to play when you were kids called Truth and Dare? Okay, so... There's too many people here for me to play truth and dare with all of you, so I'll play with it by myself. Um, the dare part is I dare you to admit something really embarrassing about yourself in front of a group of people. And so what I'm going to admit to you is that I am a virgin to the Autism One conference. This is my, my first time here. And um, I have to tell you that um, in the last week or last a few days, I've, I've certainly lost my virginity in this Autism One conference. And just like losing one's virginity, it's a life-altering experience. And what I have come away from uh, is a life-altering experience um, after uh, several conversations and sitting on uh, a bunch of lectures and, and, and speaking to the parents. Um, this is really something else. So I, I, I thank everybody for putting this together. Um, I thank the organizers for, for having me. Um, but this is a trip. That's, that's the dare part. Um, let's get on to the truth part. Right? The truth part's a little bit trickier. And the truth part is a, a little bit more political. The truth is that the Orthodox medical community does not accept raising glutathione as a treatment for ASD or autism. Now, why is that? You all have been sitting in on a number of lectures, some more complicated than others. But it's quite clear, as presented by some brilliant minds, that glutathione plays such an important role in autism. So why hasn't this exploded yet? Well, you all know the challenges of trying to get funding for autism. And one of the uh, things that one would have to accept by Taking to heart that glutathione is important in autism, you would have to accept that exposure to toxins, in particularly mercury, is important in the development of autism. By doing that, you're potentially putting a large group of people, a large industry, culpable worried about having their cells pointed out and saying, you're guilty of something. So it becomes difficult. And when I talk about glutathione, and as soon as I talk about glutathione and mercury uh, to a number of physicians, this becomes a kind of a cringe-worthy position. And so the money needs to be found. The time needs to be put in to continue chasing down this thesis that raising glutathione in autism is going to be one of the more important things 
that you could do. And I say you, I'm not just talking to the scientists, I'm not just talking to the clinicians, I'm talking to the parents. So along those lines, talking about talking to parents, you know, I've given many talks to families and many talks to the general public. I've given just as many talks to medical audiences, giving grand rounds, speaking at conferences. More rarely do I speak to a crowd of physicians, researchers, and parents at the same time. But this is the first time I've ever spoken to a crowd of clinicians and parents, but parents that generally know more about this disease process than the average doctor out there in the field. So this was, made me anxious giving this talk because I didn't know at what level I should be speaking at. Of course, I have an academic background, I've done research, so my inclination was try to impress the hell out of the other researchers here and the scientists here. I'm not going to do that because I can get a hold of these people through the internet or at conferences. I'm going to speak at the level of the parents here who are quite sophisticated. <laughs> So if there's stuff that comes up that looks like perhaps I'm patronizing, I, I apologize in advance. If you need more information, you can reach me. I'm also going to be at the uh, Immunitech booth out there after the lecture and, and into the evening. So I'm going to also consider that I may not be the only Autism One virgin here. And there's probably some parents here that, oh, there's one, okay, wow, truthful. So for you guys, I, I don't know what your level of knowledge is about glutathione, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start really on a very basic level. So glutathione, this particular community of people who are interested in autism is extraordinarily unique in that it may be the first time I ever walked into a group of non-professionals and most of you have heard of glutathione before. When I go to speak in front of a group of doctors that are not interested in autism, sadly enough, most of them don't have a clue what glutathione is don't have a clue, even though there's over 100,000 articles written on glutathione. So this is very, very easy for you to access online. And you need to do this. You need to verify whatever anybody else is telling you. You need to do your, home, your own homework. And this is a bunch of keeners here. You all do your homework like crazy. Okay, so glutathione. Again, I'm sorry if this is patronizing for some of you, but I just want to get through some basic slides. Glutathione is already in your body, it's already in your kid's body. It's in every cell of your body. Okay? It's already there. Glutathione is already there. It's not a foreign substance to the body. And if you start to do a little bit of reading on glutathione, you will just be quite overwhelmed at the number of roles that glutathione plays uh, inside of your cell, uh, in your physiology, in your biochemistry, at many, many levels. But I'm going to try uh, because we only have less than an hour uh, to, to simplify some of these roles. If you remember the word AID, then you're probably going to cover 90% of what glutathione does in your body. A stands for antioxidant, I for the immune system, and D for detoxification. Let's look at these in turn. A for antioxidant. Now you see a statement up there almost looks more like a marketing statement than, than a scientific statement. Glutathione, the master antioxidant. Now, why would anybody have the audacity to make a statement like that? Well, quite clearly, glutathione, and I'll give you a number of reasons why it's the master antioxidant. Now, I didn't put down the most powerful antioxidant. I didn't put down 
the strongest antioxidant because quite eloquently, I, I, I sat in on a lecture by uh, Dr. Richard Death, and he said something I thought I, I really, really appreciated, and I think not enough people appreciate. It's not about being the most powerful antioxidant, because whether you believe in God, or whether you believe in Darwin, we are designed to have a certain level of oxidation. We are designed to have a certain level of free radicals. And you can't just wipe out that system. The oxidation, antioxidant system, like every other system in the body, is a balance. And if you tip too far on one side or the other, if you have too much antioxidation, that's not necessarily a good thing. The eloquence about glutathione, because it already exists in your cell, this is beautiful. If you can prompt your cell to make glutathione, your cell has an innate intelligence that's been there for hundreds of thousands of years, whereby it will make its optimal amount of glutathione and no more. You can't force your cell to make more than its optimal amount. So it's self-regulated, so you cannot tip over where you've got too much antioxidation on board. This is such an eloquent system, of course, designed by nature. The other reason, and this one will also strike home for you, we know in science of over 2,000 different antioxidants. And you all could shout them out, vitamin C and vitamin E and pycnogenols and a long list of antioxidants. You go to the corner store, you find a, a wall full of antioxidants. Now the difference between those antioxidants and glutathione, number one, glutathione is the only antioxidant after it neutralizes a free radical does not itself turn into a free radical. The only one. And finally, the bottom line on glutathione and antioxidation is that all of the other antioxidants that we know of, all of the other antioxidants we know of cannot work without the presence of glutathione. Because if you look at the, all these antioxidants working like a series of gears in a clock, well, a clock needs a spring, and the spring that's driving the whole process of antioxidation is the glutathione molecule. And again, we can get into the biochemistry, but I would bore the hell out of you, and we can talk about that later this afternoon. So A, glutathione, the master antioxidant. I, glutathione, is literally nutrition for your immune system. And we could spend two weeks just looking at glutathione and the immune system. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll really condense it down into a few sentences. People with low glutathione levels have poor immune function. People with high glutathione levels have a much better, more profound, active immune system. And we've looked at this uh, back at McGill University for over 40 years. Um, our, our, uh, some of our initial studies uh, was looking at the model of immunodeficiency, which is AIDS, HIV. Okay, this is an immunodeficiency disease. And we knew that AIDS patients, and this is studies done in Stanford, uh, California, that AIDS patients, by definition, were going to be glutathione deficient. Not only glutathione deficient whole body, but glutathione deficient in the specific lymphocytes, the specific white blood cells that went wrong in an AIDS patient. So what do you do with that material? Try to raise glutathione levels in AIDS patients. And we did that. We did those studies. We got funding from uh, the Canadian government through what's called a HIV trials network. Um, I mean, outside of the studies, I mean, we were taking, we were taking guys who weighed you know, 80 and 90 pounds and getting them back to work. 
But we don't put that in the study. But what we put in the study are things that the scientists are and that clinicians are, are interested in, things like viral load, uh, CD4 lymphocyte count, and all these other parameters that we use to uh, measure the progression of an AIDS patient. And we attracted a ton of attention. And probably next to the, AIDS, next to the autism community, the community that knows more about glutathione than anybody else, is the HIV AIDS community. But this, uh, this applies for AIDS, it applies for hepatitis, we've done studies in, 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 in bacteria. Uh, any infectious process is going to drop your glutathione levels. So I, glutathione, nutrition for your immune system. D, for detoxification. I think if anybody wants to learn anything about detoxification, they need to show up to a conference like this. And what does glutathione detoxify? Well, geez, if I had a screen that went down to the basement of this building, I would be able to fill it with substances that are detoxified by glutathione. Let's look at some of these. We're looking at automobile exhaust. We're looking at pesticides. We're looking at herbicides. We're looking at all that junk that comes out of the chemical uh, industry. We're looking at, here's, here's one that, uh, that's going to strike home, uh, we're looking at mercury. We're looking at all, most other heavy metals. And in fact, the way glutathione deals with these heavy metals like mercury, like lead, like cadmium, um, it, it, it's actually, it chelates them. Uh, glutathione will chelate um, many of these charged uh, uh, heavy metals. What lowers our glutathione levels? Well, we see a chart here. Uh, drugs, uh, there's a whole bunch of drugs that lower glutathione levels, uh, not just street drugs. When I say drugs, I'm talking about pharmaceuticals as well. Uh, probably the most common phar pharmaceutical drug that lowers glutathione level, um, you may know this, most people don't, is, is acetaminophen. You all know what acetaminophen is, Tylenol, Adesol. And it's, uh, it's, it's rather severe on glutathione levels. And I predicted uh, 10 years ago uh, that uh, at one time uh, that there was going to be a day where on bottles of Tylenol and acetaminophen there were going to be warnings uh, for people like those with extensive liver damage, uh, for HIV patients, uh, for alcoholics, that, that the Tylenol needs to be uh, treated uh, with a lot of respect. And it, we're right around the corner. It may have already started happening in certain parts of the world. So drugs, poor diet. Do I need to talk to you about poor diet? Okay. You all know what it's like trying to get your fussy kid to eat properly. Okay, so poor diet will absolutely contribute to a drop in glutathione levels. Injury, trauma, burns. If you go to an intensive care unit and you measure glutathione levels in the patients in the ICU, inevitably they're going to have low glutathione levels. Infection, disease, we just talked a little bit about that. Tens of thousands of articles. Pollution, toxins, the aging process. Okay, now you're not thinking about your kids anymore, you're thinking about yourself. Um, glutathione levels uh, actually drop about 10% every decade. So someone like myself, between the ages of 25 and 60, um, I, I might be 20%, 40% low on glutathione levels were I not doing something about it. And on and on and on. So all of these challenges to glutathione levels, all of these challenges sucking up your glutathione levels, what would life be like if your glutathione levels were never normal? Now, you and I, at certain times of the day, like right after a good, healthy meal, our glutathione levels are fine. They might drop overnight. They might drop if we're under stress. But what if your glutathione levels were never normal? Okay, so this is the segue into how this is applicable in autism. We need to go back 1978. What is that? 25 years? 30 years? I'm a better doctor than I am a mathematician. But it's a long time ago. Uh, 
and there were just a, a couple little articles that, that came out. In, in this case, it was a, a, a French article um, that discovered that uh, autism, uh, kids with autism, were going to have low glutathione levels. I mean, look how old this paper is. They didn't even call it autism. They called it infantile psychosis. It's an old name, old name. And this kind of went to bed in the research community for, for a number of years and didn't, didn't really come back until uh, this century, where uh, here we, we see a couple articles coming out of uh, Scandinavian uh, countries that, again, looked at this and documented that glutathione levels are low in ASD. Okay. So interesting, but again, didn't drum up a lot of attention. It wasn't until, I, I, I believe that this is a, for me anyways, was, was a breakthrough article. This is work that was done by uh, Jill James um, in, in Arkansas. And uh, her paper came out and for whatever reason made a big splash. It certainly caught my attention and got me going on this. And clearly, clearly, it showed that the vast majority of kids with ASD were low in glutathione. Not a little low, like low, low. And that garnered more attention and more research, and we started looking at other places. I mean, certainly that research has been repeated several times, demonstrating low glutathione levels in autistic kids. But here, something a little bit with lateral thinking. What about moms? What about if the pregnant mother was low in glutathione? Now, we didn't go ahead and just look for, for pregnant mothers. This group over here uh, was looking for a specific gene abnormality. See, not everybody has normal glutathione. There are, there are errors of, of, uh, uh, of uh, um, metabolism whereby some people are missing specific genes that have normal glutathione levels. And if you follow these people, if they get pregnant, they have a much higher risk of having an autistic kid. That's lateral thinking. And if you look at this specific group of gene abnormalities, and I'm not saying that autism is a genetic abnormality, I'm saying that if you have abnormal genes for the production of normal glutathione levels, your chances of developing ASD are far greater. So you got to keep on digging. And when you dig further, you find out that it's not just whole body glutathione levels. If you actually get these kids' brains on autopsy and look at glutathione levels, in the brain of autistic kids, you will find low glutathione activity. So we're getting closer and closer to what's going on. I haven't seen any studies that actually did biopsies on the kids' intestinal system or digestive system. Somebody's going to look at it, and I'll bet you they're going to find the same thing. You recognize some of the authors here. They were speaking here this weekend, uh, brilliant people, the, the, the brothers Geyer, um, and made the association between mercury and glutathione. And of course, the major substance in your cell, in your neurons, to eliminate mercury is glutathione. All right. I've seen this slide or similar slides flashed on the wall in several lectures. It's uh, the result of some brilliant work of a number of scientists. Um, I, I think uh, Jill James is the one to uh, put it together for me the most eloquently. And I don't want to go through the biochemistry with you. There are other lecturers that are far better than I am in explaining the biochemistry. And there are some people in this room that just don't have a background in the biochemistry. And I don't think that's why you came to this lecture, for me to teach you about molecules. But let me summarize just quickly over here. There's a number of cycles that take place. 
And remember, this is still a simplification of what's going on. You've got the folate cycle, you've got the methylation cycle, and the transsulfuration cycle. Okay, and these all work in tandem. Now, I spent the better part of last night wondering how to translate this to a lay audience. So I pulled out some pictures. Um, last week, I actually spent two weeks uh, in, in Britain and Ireland uh, giving lectures uh, on glutathione. And what I learned in the UK, please listen to this carefully. Americans should not drive in the UK. <laughs> First of all, you get into a car and every cell of your body says, oh my God, I'm on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> and the other thing that you see a lot more of, I've only ever seen this in Boston on a regular basis, are these roundabouts. Traffic lights? What's a traffic light? You've got to get through these, these roundabouts. And they can be a mess. Here's, here's a simple roundabout. Okay. Here's a, a double roundabout. Okay. If, if you're an American, okay, try to get from there to there. Think you can do it? Betcha you can't. Not on the first try. Here's a triple roundabout. By the time you're finished this, you have no frickin' idea which way you're heading. Okay. Why am I showing you these slides? Why am I showing you these slides? Look at this diagram, and let me show you where some of the problems might take place. Free radicals, oxidation, oxidative stress, all these words that you hear bouncing around. Let's consider that little red, nasty looking thing, a free radical. And we look at where the free radicals can affect these roundabouts, these, these uh, um, uh, highways. It could be at the folate cycle. It could be at the methylation cycle. It could be at the interchange uh, where homocysteine uh, turns into glutathione in the sulfuration uh, uh, pathway. So that's where the free radicals can interfere with the flow of this traffic. And we know that these free radicals can be, we know that, that Glutathione is a key for mopping up these free radicals. We also know that the limiting factor for your cells to be able to manufacture glutathione is the amino acid cysteine. Okay, y'all got that? Okay, then what the hell? Bypass that traffic jam. Because if we go back here, okay, here, there, the free radicals ca cause a flat tire, there, the free radicals stalled car, there, the free radical is caused an automobile accident, but you gotta get down here, right? So, this is my thesis. Bypass the traffic jam by entering at this point, by raising cysteine and allowing your cell to make glutathione. Now, again, I'm so sure of this, but I'm not the brightest guy in the room here. And there are people out there looking at this, and I know there's other scientists there. I want you to come back to me with feedback and tell me if you think I'm wrong. But so far, the few studies that we have have shown me that I'm not wrong. These are small trials. These are not huge trials. Some of them don't have statistical significance, but at least people are starting to look at raising glutathione in autism and having some success. Okay, there needs to be more of these. Uh, here's one study that I was involved with, with a rather brilliant uh, person, uh, uh, Dr. Janet Kern, some of you know her. This was a pilot study where we were using this substance called Immunocal, uh, which is essentially a cysteine delivery vehicle. And 
Sure, it was a small study, but it, when we looked at, at, uh, at it, we're not looking at fancy schmancy biochemistry and, and all this other stuff that is really important. I'm an emergency physician. I'm a pragmatic guy. I'm a practical guy. You know, I'm, I'm in the emergency room. I've got to save somebody's life. I can care less about the biochemistry. I want to know after I push that drug into their vein, it's actually going to do something for them. Here we're looking at things, behavioral scales in these kids. And again, small numbers, but they all improve. They all improved. Can we walk away with this and say this is secure? Absolutely not. We need to do much more research. And when we say much more research, I'm going to explain what a meta-analysis is. Many of you already know what a meta-analysis is. But for, for the layperson, you, you take a whole bunch of different research studies and you lump them together and try to make sense of them. In this case, um, they took studies all the way from 1979 to the time they published the article, and they, they had almost 40 studies looking at glutathione and autism, and they concluded, yeah, of course, glutathione is important in this, all these pathways here. But they also concluded that there just needs to be more studies done. There has to be large interventional studies with statistical significance so that the obsessive compulsive reductionistic doctors and biochemists and researchers out there accept this and take it to heart. And that's one of the things I'm asking you guys to, to help me with. Um, this is a study uh, that uh, I'm involved with. Um, this is down in, in Florida at uh, Nova Southeastern. It's also funded by a very, very uh, great group of people, the Mailman Siegel Institute, um, who focuses on, on autism. So you need, um, uh, you need to look at this. I need your help. Everybody, we, we all need each other's help. Uh, we're recruiting uh, patients. So if you know anybody in the, in the uh, um, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Miami area, uh, that's you know within driving distance um, of this place. Please, please, we don't have enough patients. There's a, there's a um, kind of a competition for patients. You'd think there'd be enough autistic patients out there, but not enough that want to volunteer for a study. Um, we're, we're looking at a double-blind interventional study, and our endpoints. Although we are going to look at things like glutathione levels and oxidized versus reduced glutathione levels, the primary endpoint here is not biochemical. The primary endpoint here is behavioral outcome. Again, the biochemistry is essential for our understanding, but we could care less unless a kid gets better. The eligibility is uh, kids who are three to five. It uh, doesn't matter if they're males or female. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up just for, for a couple of minutes. Um, there's, a, there's an Immunical, Immunitech booth out there where, where you can get some of the forms and, and a clinical uh, tr uh, tri look, download from the Clinical Trials Network. Um, you could look it up yourself if, if you're uh, electronically inclined at uh, the clinicaltrials.gov. This is the uh, um, this is the study number. Um, or you can call uh, the, the main researcher there, uh, and, and some of you know her, uh, Dr. Cass John. Uh, that's her phone number. Uh, but please, don't wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go, Shh, great idea, I'm going to call her. Okay, wait till tomorrow. <laughs> or actually, tomorrow's Sunday. Wait till Monday. So just to sum this together and put it into a framework, we know that without glutathione, we have poor immune function. We know that with low glutathione, we have free radical damage. We know that with low glutathione, we have a buildup of this huge number of toxins. All of these lead to inflammation of the brain and damage to the nervous system. And by intervening, by raising glutathione levels, I think that much of this can be put to bed. How do you raise glutathione? Well, obviously, before we had supplements, we must have gotten it from our food. But this is pretty tough. Not only are you dealing with kids that don't want to eat anything but 
check one or two items. You and I, well, let's look at some foods that are rich in glutathione. Probably the food that is richest in glutathione levels. Let me, let me point out one thing. You cannot eat glutathione, okay? This is very, very important. If you're going to walk away from this lecture remembering one thing, you can't eat glutathione. Well, I guess you can eat it, but it becomes rapidly broken down. It doesn't make it to your cells. Okay. The, the, the way to get glutathione levels up in your body, up in the cells, up in the brain, is to give these cells the building blocks, the nourishment, what we call the precursors for the cells to make glutathione themselves. So where do we find glutathione precursors? Well, in our life, the best source of glutathione precursors um, is in mother's milk, something that's really easy to get. No laughs today. <laughs> Once in your life. Okay. The other place that you can get glutathione precursors is not just in human mother's milk, but is in animal mother's milk. But there's a problem there. What's the problem with whole milk? for kids with autism. I know you all know the answer. So you're also getting a lot of casein. And the casein, as you've seen in other lectures, is problematic. We can get it from fresh vegetables. Now, why do I say fresh milk? Why do I say fresh vegetables? Because the precursors for the cells to make glutathione are extremely sensitive to heat, what we call thermolabile. If you heat these proteins, they lose their ability to raise glutathione levels. So if you're talking about milk off the shelf, even if you wanted to try that, there wouldn't be any glutathione precursors in there because what do we do to milk? What do we do to cheese? We pasteurize them. Pasteurization is heating. So we've killed the activity of these proteins in their regards to raising glutathione. <coughs> vegetables. What do we do to vegetables? Well, sure, sometimes we eat them raw. But this is hard to get in 2014. Just as an example, again, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to relate to the, your very, very basic needs here. Do you think that the potato or the peach, I'm speaking to the older people in the audience, that your mom put on your plate when you were a kid is at all similar to what you're going to buy at the market today? So what we've done to the genetics of these plants, what we've done to the soils, the additional crap that we've put onto these foodstuffs, it's really, really hard to get it from vegetables. So you'd have to eat enough broccoli so that the toxic environment in your bedroom was so high at night that your spouse got sick, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, to raise glutathione, it's very uncomfortable. And you're not going to give your kid a, a boatload of, of, of broccoli to eat. Um, there are other sources of glutathione precursors. And one of them is meat. And what did I say about heating? Normally, we cook our meat. Now, if for some strange reason your kid is into eating sushi three times a day, well, then maybe he's getting glutathione precursors, and maybe you're getting broke. <laughs> and eating raw meat, oh, just to, I mean, medically, not such a great idea. Once in a while, maybe, but there, there are other things. So what about intravenous glutathione? Now, people have used intravenous glutathione. You might see great videos of people using intravenous glutathione. Intravenous glutathione and Parkinson's, for example, Somebody might walk into a clinic like this with Parkinson's, they get to intravenous therapy, and then, you know, they're breakdancing. Um, yeah. But the problem is by the time they get home, they're back to their state. So intravenous glutathione has a very, very short half-life. Um, it can be exceedingly expensive. Uh, you take the risks of intravenous, it's, it's annoying, and who's going to do that three, four times a day? The best Studies done with intravenous glutathione are the studies that, that do that several times a day. We were talking about cysteine. Why not just eat cysteine? As a free amino acid, L-cysteine, as an isolated amino acid, it doesn't work. 
Because when you eat cysteine, L-cysteine, it becomes rapidly oxidized. And it, it, it can make you feel sick, in fact. And if too much cysteine gets into your bloodstream, you end up with a state called hypercystinemia. And the problem with cysteine, when it's oxidized, it acts as a free radical. Many antioxidants, once they're oxidized, act as a free radical. So oral cysteine doesn't work. So people have looked at this, and they said, well, what kind of cysteine delivery vehicles do we have? And 40 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, N-acetylcysteine was invented. You take the cysteine, and you tag an acetyl group onto it to prevent it from being oxidized. This is a marvelous drug. I use this drug in the emergency department for people who are on their deathbed. For example, people who have taken two bottles of extra strength Tylenol, I know they're going to be dead in two to three days. So I use N-acetylcysteine. And I use a whack of N-acetylcysteine. I give them like 40,000 milligrams intravenously. And I've never treated an acetaminophen overdose with N-acetylcysteine where they didn't throw up on my shoes. My wife hates that. N-acetylcysteine can be bought without a prescription as a so-called natural substance, which it's not, uh, at health food stores. But it's still problematic. Most kids don't like taking N-acetylcysteine because it smells like rotten eggs. And even the ones that smell a little bit better, they upset their stomach. And N-acetylcysteine has a short half-life. So if you felt sick the first time you took it, well, you're going to feel four times as sick the fourth time you took it. Because of the short half-life, you can't just take it once a day. It makes no sense. You get a spike in glutathione, and then sometimes it crashes down even below baseline. So you need to give it multiple times during the day. When I treat somebody in the emergency department with N-acetylcysteine, I hang up a bag, and it's delivering the N-acetylcysteine over a 24-hour period. And finally, even for the people that can tolerate and acetylcysteine, they'll feel sick with it. Most of them will tell you that after two or three weeks, they feel washed out, and it just doesn't seem to be working anymore. And the reason that is, nobody knows this, but a few people. Remember I said to protect the cysteine from being oxidized, you put an acetyl group on it? Does it protect the cysteine? Yeah. How much does it protect the cysteine? It allows about 15% of it to make it to your cell. What does that mean? It means 85% of it is out there being oxidized, and eventually you build up hypercystinemia, and you end up with a pro-oxidant state, and you've completely undone what you hoped you'd be doing. So for a short term, the drug N-acetylcysteine, sure. It's great. For long-term use, just don't suggest it. Then there are subfractions of whey proteins. You all heard of whey proteins. The problem with most whey proteins is that they're derived from the milk industry. What do we say about anything, any milk products? What do you do with them? Pasteurize them. Okay, so the majority of the proteins that you will find in whey, even whey protein isolates, they're usually highly degraded. And when you heat up these proteins, they just don't work. But if you're able to have a technique where you can tease out the specific proteins in whey that are glutathione precursors, then, then those can work. And that is actually um, the, the, the company that, that pays most of my consulting fees is a company called Immunitech. They make Immunical, and, and this is their whole uh, raison d'etre. Now, there's lots of other things that, out there that say uh, they raise glutathione. I don't know. Again, I, I, I am from the orthodox medical community. I am a scientist. So I, I, I'm still stuck on this. Forgive me. Um, I still think that you're giving your kids things that are A, proven to be safe, and B, less importantly, if you want to waste your money, proven to be efficacious. So just to conclude, I'll wrap this up. Clearly, research tells us 
that autistic kids have a glutathione problem, quite clearly. Small studies have shown that raising glutathione in autistic kids works. And finally, these larger studies are absolutely essential. They're essential because if they get out there and they get published, the doc that works in the strip mall will start to appreciate that this is a potential treatment and a lot more parents and kids can have access to reasonable, well-studied means of taking care of this enormous problem. So please, I'm asking the parents here, if you know anybody in the Florida area, I'm asking the clinicians here, I'm asking the researchers here, see if you can find some kids to, to uh, register and take, place, uh, take part in this study. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a substance that has really very, very little downside. Uh, we've shown this in our, in our, um, our pilot studies and it's going to do a lot of good. And I hope um, that everybody walks away from here with some good information that you could use. Thank you very much.